and welcome to the unknown webcast this is just a bit of a trigger warning uh for those who believe words are more injurious than sticks and stones i really am so conservative i can't turn left even when i'm driving in addition to giving trigger warnings to our viewers ron hensel and i both drink coffee for your protection yes, this we week Corey miller joins us to talk about cancel culture on campus 2.0 what your kids will be facing this fall. My name is Don Vino. I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in Wonder Lake, Illinois, which produces the Unknown Webcast. And our senior researcher is Ron Hensel, who will introduce the sponsors of today's webcast. And here is Ronnie Baby. Greetings from sunny Florida, where the palm tree came out, saw its shadow, and now <laughs> what happened? <laughs> okay. How do I get back here? And I don't know. Stream. Oh, there it is. Uh, okay. Don, what do I do? I'm here. Okay, I'm going to remove, I'm going to stop sharing, and then I'm going to okay. start sharing again. Hello, Corey. Wait. Start over. I'm starting all over from scratch here. Greetings from sunny Florida, where, where, where something isn't happening. Do you know why this is happening, Don? I don't know. It looks like your browser is not giving you enough energy. Uh, you know what I think it is? No, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm So I'm clicking on all the proper things, and I'm hitting the share button. And here we are. Well, greetings from sunny Florida, where the palm tree came out, saw its, there we go, saw its shadow, and now we have 12 more months of summer. Our sponsor for this edition of the Unknown Webcast is World's End Theology Outlet, your one-stop resource for half-baked heresies, dubious doctrines, and other ideas whose time has gone. World's End Theology Outlet. Our regular legal disclaimer, our guest on today's webcast, insert name here, that would be Corey Miller, has no connection whatsoever to any of the satirical content of the Unknown Webcast, here after known as the webcast, although we probably will not mention it again. The satirical content includes any and all commercials, end credits, puns, smart remarks, or anything else that might fall under the definition of satire. In the meantime, Midwest Christian Outreach Inc. bears no liability for or responsibility for anyone's opinions regarding this satirical content. Our regular announcements notice the opinions expressed on this webcast are ours and should be yours too if you enjoy it or if it really annoys you and you want to inflict it on someone else to ensure your continued access, please go to midwestoutreach.org, click the yellow donate button and con contribute as you feel that and as you do, never fear this webcast is Y2K compliant and don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite video channels. And now we introduce our special guest, Corey Miller. <laughs> yeah, we have special thank you for you. Actually, please do it for everybody. So you can say that anyways. Greetings, Corey Miller. Welcome Greetings. to the Unknown Webcast. Greetings and salutations. Glad you made it. By the way, I want to mention this as we're getting started. Uh, we're not talking about this book today, but we do want people to be aware of it. We will be talking about this at the end of the month, actually. It's a new book that has just come out by Corey. Called. Oh, my. We're that getting that. Good. I don't think it's our fault. I think we just have to wait, you know, be a little patient. We just have to wait and be more patient and say, there is a book there. You're just not seeing it displayed. It's uh this is very disconcerting so we're going to take for me too. i feel i feel oh, better now that it's happening to you. <laughs> responding to the mormon missionary message i think i'll try that one more time and see what happens what is with the share screen today yeah it's and i'm glad it's not just me no they're spinning spinning and now no, let's go on we'll we'll come back to that later I have a feeling um, this doesn't bode well for our commercials or end credits. So, Well, but we'll see. Hopefully it'll clear up by then. Uh, so responding to the Mormon missionary message by Corey Miller and Ross Anderson. Who is Ross Anderson, by the way? He is a Utah pastor who's been pastoring for about 30 years, I think, in Utah, 30 to 40 years. Former Mormon himself, doctorate of ministry, and used to teach at Salt Lake Theological Seminary when it was still there. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So, and you are, and you've been on before, you're the president of Rosio Christi, and you are involved in campus ministry, primarily apologetics in campus ministry setting. 
So you are a perfect candidate for what we're going to talk about today. Now, I'm going to try to share one more time because I have some quotes here, if we can get it to work, uh, from the National Association of Scholars, which I found interesting as I was doing a little bit of show prep. And I, I have a link to this article, by the way, in the description panel. No, it's not coming up. Uh, okay, so forget that. Uh, the National Association of Scholars counts 279 cancellations in the United States of Canada. So there's 279 academic cancellations of scholars in universities. Now, can we get a definition at some point of what that means? But keep going. Yeah, they were professors predominantly uh, at academic universities and college campuses. Uh, and they were canceled. Does that mean they lost their jobs? Lost or? their jobs. They had, oh, okay. had to leave the institutions of higher learning. Whoa. Uh, and uh, they uh, tell us that uh, for untenured professors and administrators, this discipline may take the form of suspension or firing, but always with a large dose of public humiliation. Tenured facility have more protections, but schools often make their jobs harder through burdensome investigations and never-ending sensitivity and implicit bias trainings. Canceled students may have their professional careers ruined before they even begin. Although the role of ritual in relation to... Oops, that's not it. Uh, okay, so uh, professors are being dismissed, canceled. Students may be dismissed, canceled. They have less uh, fight back abilities and could have their uh, careers ruined as a re result of this. Now, in that setting, you're doing mission work and with apologetics in a cancel culture setting. So what do students that haven't been to the university yet, or even if they have, need to know in order to survive? Well, I think people need to <clears throat> realize that in just the, ne the next couple of weeks, it starts all over again. You know, thousands upon thousands, millions upon millions of young people uh, will be enrolled and attending their first classes at the universities. Right here next to me is Purdue University. 50,000 students will uh, be in this area in the next couple of weeks. And uh, before the first day of class is over, the professors, many of them, and administrators will begin the assault on students on their Judeo-Christian values. Parents will have spent their entire lives saving money that will ultimately be used to turn their children against them ideologically. Uh, they will come home for Christmas uh, with a different worldview, possibly even claiming transgender identity. I mean, Brown University now claims that 40% of its student body self-identifies somewhere on the spectrum of the LGBTQ. It's as if something was in the water and everybody in America, uh, you know, had a, had a sip of it or more. Um, talk everybody about Brown. Asian. That's that's what's happening. And so our, you know, they students are going to learn, unlearn everything that they've been taught about the foundations of liberty, the basis of morality. They'll even begin to question the existence of truth. And, uh, you know, parents and grandparents will have funded the apostasy of their own children and uh, prodigy. So uh, are they really happy to know that you believe these things over at Purdue? Well, well they... <laughs> that's why I said some professors and administrators. We, we oh, have okay. a lot of allies over there as well. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's not like there are, there are maybe a, like a few hundred points of light or what? I mean, what are you talking <laughs> about here? I mean, I don't know the count, but I mean, Purdue is not Indiana University. Uh, those are radically different schools. You know, as, as uh, Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant statues are being toppled, even David Hume, the, the father of modern skepticism, even his statues are being toppled and buildings named after him are being renamed in the name of uh, George. George Floyd, um, since 2020, many things have changed, but even those who have, you know, uh, freed the slaves, those statues are being toppled. And yet at Indiana University, just down the road from us at Purdue, uh, Alfred Kenzie, 
the sexologist who is responsible for much of the quote unquote data moving into the 60s uh, sexual revolution, his statue was just erected in the yeah. last year. And, um, you know, the president is very excited there about all the research done that Kinsey, you know, was part of. I, I don't know if she is aware that uh, he sought to get orgasms from, you know, two-year-old little children. And how he got those exhibits is another story in itself. But, um, you know, you were erecting statues of, of pedophiles, essentially, and demolishing statues of those who freed the slaves. And this is all in the great halls of learning that uh, Christians once founded, but now, uh, you know, of course, just completed on black and queer bondage at, um, at Princeton. And another one's getting ready to start again. So the coursework that's starting, the ideological uh, heavyweights that are at these places, uh, whether it's in the hard sciences, giving us naturalism and sciences, scientism, or whether it's in the humanities, giving us, um, you know, deconstructionism, postmodernism, and, and critical theory. The ideologies that are reigning in our universities are completely subversive to not just the Christian worldview, but to uh, Western civilization. And that's part and parcel why I think we can look at the foundation of cancel culture happening from the universities and bleeding out into the corporate world as it has. Yeah. So we're calling this cancel culture on campus 2.0, which I assume means we've moved on, right? We're, we're in version 2.0 of cancel culture. What makes this version different from previous iterations? I mean, it's interesting just looking at the Supreme Court case that happened recently um, taking on Harvard and University of North Carolina, that racism is now illegal <laughs> in the hiring uh, processes with respect to admissions. Uh, college admissions boards can't be, or admissions departments can't be racist anymore. They're besides themselves. What will they do? What will they do? Well, they can go underground and do the same thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, now yeah, yeah. Do, you know, pull <laughs> up certain zip codes or something like that to still find the same um, applicants that they were looking for before. There are ways that they can get around, you know, the standardization of tests because, of course, objective standards in standardized tests is said to be racist and classist and, um, you know, patriarchal and so forth as well. So there are ways to get around that through essay writing and putting more and more weight on that. So, you know, it's great to know that your your uh, surgeon uh, for the surgery you need to have coming up is, you know, going to be by someone that was brought into their position through affirmative action. Uh, it's already the case that we've got a Supreme Court justice who can't tell us what a woman is, right. uh, either because she's incompetent or because she won't tell us because she's an ideologue and the likelihood is the latter. Um, and so that's what we're finding across the board. And so just because you might have, you know, this Bud Light pushback against some of this nonsense, or you have, um, you know, the Wall Street Journal announcing that in the corporate world, people are, are quickly moving away from their DEI, or I call them DIE executives um, you know, those uh, political commissars in their corporations that they all thought that everybody needed after 2020, uh, mm -hmm. if you were not going to be called a racist. Um, people are thinking, okay, those are too expensive now in um, this economy. And number two, it's like walking on eggshells in the corporate, you know, um, zones in these buildings. And who wants it anymore? But a lot of people still want to keep it. Some feel like you don't need to go along to get along anymore. They saw Bud Light. It's not popular. Plus, they saw with the Supreme Court ruling, they're dreading that lawsuits are now going to come into the corporate world, just like they did into the universities. Nonetheless, gentlemen, so long as the ideologues are still at the highest levels, all they need to have is innovation to figure out how to uh, continue in ideologies. Streaming. Well, I, and and I, I would suggest that that is what we have seen for a century already. And most don't really realize it. We just did a, a webcast, uh, I think, last week or the week before, 
uh, kind of on the history of progressivism, and it goes back to the 19th century. So this isn't yeah. new. Uh, and then we have uh, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, Christians were leaving universities because of the influx of kind of liberalism and Marxism and founding Bible colleges over a period of about 20 years. They founded 300 Bible colleges to protect their children from this kind of stuff, which was at a low level back in those days. I mean, it was there and it was working its way through, but it hadn't really taken over everything to the degree it has today. 1945, you had the intellectual movement, uh, conservative intellectual movement rise up and go, wait a minute, we are not, we are, they started fighting for laissez-faire capitalism against the tide of Marxism. But, and then we had this firebrand in 1951 who did a great book, uh, William F. Buckley Jr. titled God and Man at Yale, in which he basically argued, look, Yale, you can teach communism all you want, socialism all you want, but you should be honest to your donors who are capitalists what you're doing. And suddenly everyone's going, well, we're not really teaching that. Well, they were. <laughs> but it slowed the tide of progressivism fairly substantially over the next 40 years or so. But now we're back at it. And they, I, I don't remember what the statistics were, but uh, I think in the 1930s, you had a ratio of about two liberals to one conservative. And today you have something like 12. Yeah, to one. It, was, it was the in Steven Pinker's book and Jonathan Haidt both, I think, mentioned it in their books. Um, Pinker's famous book right now is Enlightenment Now, the case for, I think, science, humanism and secularism and progress or something like that. So it's the case for new atheism. Again, let's have the enlightenment all over again. Um, they say that in the 90s, it was 2.3 to 1, left okay. to right. Uh, and that number has changed in the recent decade to the last decade to now. Uh, 12 to 1 for those who are age 60 and over getting ready to retire. But for those who are under the age of 40, that is the new scholars who can get tenure and then like a Supreme Court justice have a lifetime appointment. Uh, that ratio is 23 to 1. And if you're wow. looking at the New England area where all of the colonial schools or the Ivy League schools are at, uh, it's 27 to 1. And when Christian parents or grandparents think, oh, my goodness, I'm funding this, right. Johnny better at least go take a course from the religion department. No. <laughs> work. That is 70 to 1, 70 to 1. Um, and so... The likelihood that, um, you know, students are going to get someone who is conservative or Christian who is going to be explicit and risk his or her career uh, is highly unlikely. And so these are legitimately secular baptismal thoughts. Now, there is another revolution happening right now in the universities. In the last century, it was all about scientific naturalism, right? And so... Uh, various departments started changing their names. If you wanted to be in uh, with the wine and cheese parties in academia, you changed your name to something that had science behind it. So politics, which was always part of ethics for 2,500 years, was then dubbed political science or psychology, which is the study of the soul. We don't believe in that anymore. It's the brain in the century ner central nervous system. We now call that the Department of Psychological Sciences or basket weaving sciences or whatever everybody's got to well, be now, a we have, now we have studies right we have you know um, yeah now if it, if it has the word studies behind it or the word critical and it's not critical thinking because critical theory is not critical thinking uh it's it's critical marxism um in those various areas yeah i think you're seeing a revolution right now that the scientific naturalists are being uh, pushed out of their perches that they have relished for the better part of the last century. And of course, with the neo-atheism movement, um, they, they had their reign of terror for two decades. And now the Robespierre of that kind of French Revolution, uh, Richard Dawkins, is now getting the guillotine himself um, that he was trying to use yeah. against others. And you know, that is change. with respect to postmodern cultural Marxism. And it's happening in the medical uh, field, it's happening in the engineering, and even in mathematics. Those fields that should have been untouchable um, 
the this new ideology through the DIE officers, diversity, inclusivity, equity officers, has or is in the process of transforming the entire universities from the top down. Uh, those officers, uh, political commissars, are some of the most important, and they're very well paid, but most important in the entire university. When a university president hires one or 25, as it were, at Berkeley, um, you're not going to get rid of those people lest you be considered a racist, patriarchalist, or uh, heteronormativist, or um, something like that, some some bad uh, cuss word. And right. you get rid of them, you're going to get rid of your own job. So you've just hired the demise of your own institution. So are we, you know, like... Uh... The big donors pay 90% of the bill, roughly, in higher ed. Tuition goes for, does it even cover 10%? I mean, uh, I, I, I I don't know. It's, it's very low. Mm-hmm. So the money that's driving this is coming from who? I mean, who, who is it? Uh, is it that? The all of the deep pockets donors, all of the uh, the ones who really kick in during the capital campaigns, are, are they all woke now? Is it like there's nobody out there who is saying, "I want to I want to write a check for um, the study of you know conservative politics, and you know for, for a chair in that you know let's get a chair for Ayn Rand." uh studies <laughs> is any that there those people are just non-existent now other than donors to hillsdale college maybe i mean you know you're having you for decades there have been conservative donations that have been pushed back uh mm-hmm. either because like at yale they wanted to fund 20 million dollars to increase education in western civilization and they weren't going to teach these courses um, as tradition would have it. They would teach them with a critical theoretical lens, with colonialization in, in the lens. Uh, you began the movement, you know, I think it was Jesse Jackson with his march, hi-ho, hi-ho, Western Civ has got to go. And so Yale eventually, um, you know, feeling the same uh, sentiment in the waters as Stanford was, gave the gift back of 20 million dollars and recently there was a high level donor at arizona state university i have a a friend of mine who is on faculty in the philosophy department who just testified along with along with dennis prager last week before the arizona arizona state legislature on what's happening there at asu and um there was a big program that was ousted and other donor funding was not allowed because they were having conservative speakers come in like Dennis Prager. Um, And so even donors' money that's there, either the donor, him or herself, wants to pull it back because they're abusing uh, the funding, or the university will simply push it back because they don't want any of this dirty money that's guided Western civilization for the last... 2000 years, Judeo-Christian yeah. values, right? Uh, tuition obviously goes up, 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 up at various universities. And so that's paying a lot of the bills, but these public universities in particular uh, are a gold mine of taking taxpayers' money and implementing programs uh, like the Kinsey Institute for Sex Studies <laughs> down at Indiana University, right? So that we can find 18-month-old, 24-month-old babies and see if we can give them an orgasm and, and provide new data uh, for the, the sexual revolution. So, and then you're finding this too, by the way. You're finding that at Christian yeah. colleges. I mean, so, I've yeah. heard that like Biola University, uh, I think 5% of the money was coming in in 2018 from tuition uh, or from donors, sorry. The rest was coming in from tuition. Now you've got almost a quarter of the funding coming in from big level donors. And there's some billionaires that are, are funding things going on there. One of them is a board member at Biola, 
who's been a major donor to the DNC, to the Clintons, has some oh, campaign wow. finance things uh, hit up against them and stuff like that. So, yeah, you follow the money trail with some of this stuff and, and you can find problems. Um, and there's a reason why our, our politicians are in bed with, with the universities a lot of times is because they're, they've got common ideology together with them. Not all, but again, some. So like uh, we're starting to see like, I don't know how many places there are like this, but the University of Austin has probably become the symbol of a, a splitting in higher ed, uh, a splitting off. I don't know. The University of Austin is, <clears throat> they're trying to establish this university to be a, you know, a, not quite a conservative alternative, but in, in their mind, a free thought, free speech alternative. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you have places like Hillsdale yeah. and others. Um, do you see more conservative students, you know, being ushered in those directions? I mean, I've, I've got a student that I'm working with. It's a Ph.D. student in philosophy that wants to try to get a job there, um, thinking that it would be a good place to um, be a professor at. The University of Austin, like you said, is very much like Hillsdale, like Patrick Henry College, like Grove City College that don't accept any federal funding. They want no strings attached. They don't even accept the GI Bill, right, mm -hmm. so that they don't have to have the government strings attached. Well, the University of Austin has people, uh, founding scholars like Peter Bogosian, atheist, former atheist from Portland State University, uh, that I had uh, developed a, a kind of a partnership and alliance with, and Steven Pinker from Harvard at the other end of the country. So those two are ones that will be founding scholars at the university. Pinker has a view that the universities can be reformed. Bogosian thinks they all need to be burned down and we need to start <laughs> over. Um, and those two carry the same ideology, right? They're both methodological and metaphysical naturalists of the old guard. They both despise critical theory, social justice, and you know, deconstructionism and, and things like that that's coming out of the, the humanities sections, typically. Um, but, you know, whether we can revive or reform these universities right now, I'm of the opinion, along with, with uh, Steven Pinker, that I think we can. Uh, so I disagree with Bogosian, uh, but I, I get it. And I disagree with both of their worldviews. And I think that both of their worldviews are what in part caused the present yeah. nonsense. In fact, Peter Bogosian, when he asked me for an alliance about three years ago, I said, OK, I will. We'll forge a temporary alliance. But remember, your side is responsible for this nonsense we're seeing in culture right now. <laughs> yeah. You know, you laid the, the naturalistic uh, soil for this virus to emerge and grow and germinate and, then, and grow right yeah become a frankenstein and now you can't control it and so you're looking uh for help from conservative evangelicals that you would never have countenanced before you guys tried to burn us down did he concede your point two months ago he did in a podcast uh, okay. yeah he said that i think that uh no doubt that new atheism is in some respect causally responsible for the rise but you're, of you're going back before new atheism aren't you right. you're going back to the enlightenment just this, this is what brought us here aren't you uh right. well that's that's what he wants that's what they want the university of austin to i think kind of represent again the golden years for them where they thought that it was all about free thinking now from our vantage point they weren't being free thinkers they were methodological and metaphysical naturalists and they didn't want uh, Christians to come in. I mean, that great battle happened between 1880 and 1930. And by 1930, the dust was settling and we lost. We were outside of the university systems from mm -hmm. Harvard onward that we had started, right? Which for 200, 250 years, every university president in the country was also a member of the clergy, the Protestant clergy at that. Um, and we abdicated our role and responsibility in high culture and gave up ground in the universities and created a vacuum and in came the naturalists. They reigned for a hundred years, accepting our tuition dollars, accepting our student minds that they could form uh, and then pushing them out into culture. But now that 
the same thing is happening to them, which is revolution number two, it tells me that the changing of the guard has happened once, is happening a second time, and therefore what is actual and tells what is possible, it can happen a third time and it ought to happen and it ought to be by those who founded the universities in the first place, Christian thinkers. Hmm. Right. Now, I don't know if we can do our commercial or not. We can give it a shot. I'm seeing weird stuff on the screen, but hey, yeah, our friends at World's End Theology Outlet, your one-stop resource for half-baked heresies, dubious doctrines, and other ideas whose time has gone, have a message for these returning students. Uh, they want them to kind of look ahead. Uh, and they say, so after four semesters at your small progressive liberal arts college, you're flying home to visit your red state relatives. You remembered to bring your emotional support puppies. You packed all your comfort blankets and pillows. You even remembered your adult coloring books, but it still feels like something is missing. You don't feel safe. What can you do? You need instant safe space. It has patented anti-free speech technology. Instant safe space gives you guaranteed protection from, we're going a little slow and I don't know why, trigger words, microaggressions, unwelcome ideas, and cognitive dissonance. Okay, let's go back and look at that. Well, let's not do that. Feel protected, feel safe. I don't know why I'm having multiple issues today with instant safe space from World's End Theology Outlet. You're right, Don. We're having some issues. We are. Yeah. I have issues. <laughs> issues? <laughs> I have never been shy about that. I have issues, so watch yourself. Yes. So, okay. We formed the seminary, uh, the uh, universities. Maybe, I mean, they're so big. How do you even turn those ships? I, I wonder, Michelle, Michelle Mangawati, I don't know if you're aware of who he is. Good guy. Mostly a good guy. <laughs> uh, mostly. <laughs> he doesn't like the American people. Evangelical Church a whole lot. However, he's got some interesting ideas on education. His view is education started in the church has now kind of left the church for these university establishments that have now become kind of this swamp, if you will, of bad ideas. Uh, his idea is that it should be moved back into the church, K through university, uh, overseen by a, a pastor in the church, an educational pastor. And I say, I ask him, I say, well, how do you deal with the college? Well, he said, that's easy, actually, because the Internet we have today, you could have uh, for much less money, you could have uh, uh, scholars that are more reliable from anywhere on the planet who would teach a class in your setting and several classes across the country or the world at the same time. They would actually make more money financially by doing that and you would have top quality teaching at the university level by doing it that way. What do you think of that idea? I, mean, I appreciate his, I think the third wave education or whatever he's calling it. Um, I appreciate what he's doing, his writings and so forth, but it's very similar to, I think what, uh, you know, the Benedict option uh, and his next book out, Rod Dreher's his um, Live Not By Lies, a manual for Christian dissidents. I call it live not by lies, a manual for defeatist Christian dissidents. Yeah, I agree with um, that. He yeah. says, you know, the culture war is over, we lost. And I, I'm thinking, you know, the, this mentality, this bunker mentality where we just need to create cell groups in our families and our churches that are, are resistant uh, to the revolutions happening above ground uh, so that we can sustain and outlive and outlast these revolutions. It reminds me of the 80s when Americans were in fear of the Cold War and nuclear holocaust and everybody was building bunkers down below and you could drive by a city, a town, a community, and you would see people's homes that were mostly underground, partially above ground. And my thought is this idea of defeatist Christianity that 
we simply take it back inside of the church. We should have been doing that all the time anyway. Right. Why did we stop that anyway? Why can't it be both end? My take is that going down into the bunkers and waiting till the nuclear fallout comes and kills everybody above ground, and then we go back out and we restart civilization. No, no, they, they've already told us to go, um, you know, we're coming out of the closet, you go into the closet, and now they're coming into our closets too. <laughs> they are. They're coming into our closets. They don't, especially this new breed of revolutionaries, they're not just about ridiculing us like Richard Dawkins was. They're about destroying us. These Marxists are not simply uh, friendly scientists. They believe that for a scrambled uh, to have an omelet, there needs to be broken eggs. This is why they killed a hundred million people. Um, this ideology inspires them to doom. And so, no, there's no, where, where, where else are we going to go? There's no frontier to go to now. Um, we ought to be doing that already. We should have been doing that all along. Yeah, I agree. The, the problem is that if you take a statement like D.L. Moody, uh, who said, don't polish the brass on a sinking ship. The Titanic's going down, just get the souls off. And so we, we focused on Harvest Crusade after Harvest Crusade after Harvest Crusade, saving souls without thinking about cultivating tilling soil and thinking about the institutions as strategic, as if maybe Jesus wasn't coming back tomorrow. Maybe it's going to be quite some time, maybe not, who, who knows? But as C.S. Lewis says, we need to live as though he's coming back today and plan like it's not going to be for a century from now. Right. We need to um, reclaim the institutions in America. And do we need to do homeschooling? Sure. Do we need to do family discipleship? Sure. Do we need to do church discipleship? I mean, what are our churches doing now? It's skinny jeans and fog machines. I get more done on the university, secular university campus than they do. I mean, when I was teaching, Don, when I was teaching at Indiana University, a satellite campus of Alfred Kinsey, by the way, um, when I was teaching at Indiana University, one of the courses that I taught, I had prepared a four-hour lecture because I lectured for four-hour blocks uh, in a intensive courses that I was teaching. Okay. Four hours on the resurrection. Four hours. I can't get a captive audience like that in a church. Right. So, you know, reclaiming the churches, I'm thinking we should be doing that all along. But I can get more done in the secular university than I can in the churches. We've got as much hostility toward our movement in, in some churches as we do in the academy. And it's, it's, the, it's by and large a lot of the church leadership that allowed this whole fiasco to happen. Uh, that's why Mark Knoll wrote the book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. Mm -hmm. What's the scandal? That there isn't much of an evangelical mind. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm inclined to agree with Bertrand Russell, the atheist, who wrote the book, Why I Am Not a Christian, when he said most Christians would rather die than think. In fact, they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I remember uh, it's got to be 25 years ago now. I sat down with a friend who was a uh, uh, professor of philosophy at an institution uh and uh, as we sat down we started talking and having lunch and he said no i'm going to tell you something i you cannot tell anybody else about this or where it's at uh because it's just embarrassing but my first year philosophy students i have to teach them that there is such a thing as absolute truth i didn't have to do that 10 years ago because the church is not teaching them this core stuff and they're not learning it in their families. So then they're being shipped off to Christian colleges, and the, but they don't know that there's such a thing as truth that we ought to know and by which we determine everything else in our lives. Uh, I don't think that that's improved at all since those days. I mean, it truly is the case that the barbarians are no longer just at the gates, they're in the citadels. And... Even if you go to our Hillsdale Grove City College, Patrick Henry types at Grove City, for example, I just lectured there two months ago on Arabic philosophy in the history department and was meeting with some of the professors. 
um, I'm my name is on a petition to get the president removed from there because he has allowed too much infiltration in a university that doesn't even have tenure, for heaven's sake, and allowed people like Jamar Tisby to come into the chapel uh, unvetted, who three months later went to go on staff with Ibram X. Kendi. And, you know, the board says, oh, yeah, yeah, critical race theory has been happening here. It's evident we need to flush it out. And I was told by some of my friends who are on faculty there that, oh, yeah, it's not happening here now. It's flushed out. I'm there lecturing. And all I did was look up one professor's name and his his um, his Twitter profile says, stay woke. That same problematic now, this is, professor. This is Hillsdale or some other institution? This was Grove City College. So you know, that, that it's not happening. I mean, and in Grove City is one of the better schools. Um, it's, it's far uh, safer there than, say, Biola University, um, mm -hmm. which may be just a matter of time right now, given that the leadership has been hijacked from the board to the DIE officers, to the president, and now um, some of the uh, areas of academic deans. Um, <sighs> So donors need to be paying attention to this. I, I'm writing a book right now, um, From Campus to Culture, an alternative vision for the future while we still have a chance. <laughs> and looking at how this all happened, what's happening, how it began in the universities and what happens in the universities doesn't stay in the universities. Maybe Vegas is true, but not in the university. I don't think that's even true. But how, what to do about this? Uh, while we still have time. And it's a, it's a clarion call for uh, an alliteration of P's for professors, pastors, parachurch leaders, parents, uh, philanthropists, um, political allies. It's the university stupid. You know, politics is downstream from culture, culture from education. The university is at the apex of education. All of our K through 12 teachers right now are coming from these universities and people are saying, oh, you gotta go after the K through 12, you gotta stop going after college students. Well, where do you think the K through 12 teachers are getting this from? Right, right. The universities. So even if you go after K through 12 teachers right now, the ones that are hired for the year 23, 24 are gonna be just fresh out of the universities. Right. And then if you go after them, the ones for 24, 25, fresh out of the universities. We have got to stop putting chlorine downstream and thinking it's going to resolve the problem long term. Yeah. Now, I, I, I had a train of thought and it got derailed in the process of that. Uh -huh. <laughs> but because you're you're right. And oh, I know what it was. I, I think back to the first century. And because the question comes into play, how is it? that Christianity transformed culture. It took 300 years. I mean, it wasn't overnight, but what was it that was going on? And, and especially as you look in the first century, you have a lot of issues going on in the early church, certainly. Nearly every book in the New Testament was written usually to refute some kind of false teacher, false teaching, uh, false prophet, bad behavior, and correct all of those things and lay down sound doctrine. They kind of all go together. Yeah. And, and why is that? Well, because what you had was largely uh, after about 55 AD or so, pagans who had become Christians are now in the church. And so they knew what paganism was because that's what they were. Today, we have kind of the opposite effect going off. We have those who are raised in Christian churches who don't recognize paganism because they are pagans. That makes church a difficult place to train people spiritually. Well, when you look at the history of higher ed, I mean, it it doesn't, I mean, it gets off to a promising start in North America with Harvard. It, what, 16? 36. 36, yeah. yeah. But by 1800, it's basically a Unitarian institution. Uh yeah early 1800s right around then so uh princeton manages well princeton of course is founded 
much later, but and it hangs on until it doesn't go not, not too much later. I mean, um, you know, Princeton was number four. I think it went Harvard, then Yale. Saw Harvard drifting and up the ante from Veritas to looks at Veritas, light and truth. And then right after that, it was uh, William and Mary and Princeton and then Columbia University. Uh, but all of which, again, had their central focus on training right. Christian pastors, missionaries and ministers um, until, yeah, eventually what happened was we didn't have any grad schools. I think maybe Johns Hopkins was the first to get one. And so all of our brightest students would go over to Europe, uh, mostly Germany at the time. Uh, for graduate degrees. And at that time, you know, you're having um, the rise of Darwinism, you're having uh, biblical uh, criticism happening, and so forth. And our people would come back with uh, a new PH to their D philosophy. And because they now had graduate degrees, they would step into the influential post of these universities. And the battle for the university was on right after the Civil War. 1880 mm -hmm. to 1930 and they won we lost started over retrenched a tactical retreat you might call it and now those institutions too are are under fire but with phase two of the revolution that began with naturalism but then whereas darwin gave us a sense of our origin marx gives us a sense of our purpose our, our telos yeah. well, what you find it, i mean by the end of the 19th century what you find is that uh, in many of these uh, divinity schools that were the legacies of, you know, what was once the College of New Jersey and, you know, Harvard and Yale and, and so on, as they were originally founded to train ministers, is that they're now, even in their seminaries, have unbelievers teaching. I mean, not all of them. I, I don't want to say they're all unbelievers, but they found their way in. When you have Charles Augustus Briggs teaching at Union Seminary, you've got an unbeliever. <laughs> you've got an unregenerate person teaching. Um, and yet he he managed to be uh, acquitted by his presbytery in New York. Mm. Uh, there were major problems. And it, there were major problems that right uh, leading up to the First Great Awakening. There were there, even you could argue even bigger problems leading up to the second great awakening. There is this downward pull of sin, downward pull of unbelief that, um, you know, we keep on reliving the same it's, you know, so I'm, you know, I, I kind of, uh, which one was it? It was Bogosian who says, burn it all down and start over. Yeah. I, I, I sometimes see a bigger, a stronger case for, the, you know, not, burn it all down, just abandon ship and start a new one. That's the pattern we keep seeing. I mean, you, you had to leave Princeton to found Westminster. Uh, well, that's, that's I even right. say to burn it down, I'm not even sure what that would look like because you have uh, Harvard, for example, they have such a huge amount of money they're sitting on. How do you even do that? Right. They have they have enough money to last uh, until Jesus comes back. So. So it's a good it's a good question. Uh, I don't think you really can burn those down. I think you need to take them back. I think you need to minimally find ways to follow Antonio Gramsci's plan of neo-Marxism. And it's called the long march through the institutions. And it's going to take uh, a a launching, a concerted effort launching is something uh, very systematic and methodical like that and not expect to see the change happen in our lifetime. It didn't happen in Gramsci's lifetime. You know, it was in the 1930s that uh, I said that the, the first revolution happened in the university's dust was settling. Well, that same decade in the 1930s, you end up having um, the um, Frankfurt School of Critical Theory begin right. in Germany, uh, the neo-Marxists, and then you had the cultural Marxist, Antonio Gramsci, in Italy. And so you have the Axis power um, socialists, not the Nazi national socialists, but the globalist socialists, Antifa. Antifa was happening in um, 
the Axis powers and they had to get out of there. And they moved to America, started at Columbia University and Brandeis and then UCLA and and, and as, as the story goes, well, and, and uh, have decades, decades, and authored, decades, but now they're in the influential positions, and now they're starting revolution number two and kicking out the old guard. So when Dawkins was at the height of the naturalist revolution, he became the figurehead, the Robespierre of that revolution, uh, out there beheading everybody who disagreed with him, and now his head is sitting on the guillotine. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you also have Dewey, 1930s, uh, yeah. Humanist Manifesto, uh, Teachers College, the idea that we need to uh, use a school system to educate everyone into Marxism uh, through the school system. So a lot happened in that decade. You're right about that. Yeah, and just recently, I mean, you know, you're, you're finding like through government money, you're finding these universities hiring with millions and millions and millions of dollars. I think 400 million went to Berkeley to hire like 25 die officers, political commissars, uh, to ensure that the political truth was being pushed throughout all the system. And just recently, I think uh, University of Michigan has spent uh, $80 million on diversity, inclusivity, equity. Um, and so that's our tax dollars, right, that are going to do this. And uh, it's hiring political commissars, political officers for the Red Party um, to go in and force um, all of these departments to start putting studies or critical uh, on the name of their departments because it's a new revolution happening now. It's the, it's the People's Republic <laughs> of Marx happening in our universities. And so... It's proof positive that it that it has happened, that it can happen. And while we should be in our churches and in our cloisters and some places in our bunkers trying to strengthen these cells for resistance, we also need to be making headway in reclaiming these institutions because they're not going away. You know, I was talking to Ron, um, I think it was this morning, maybe. I've been thinking a lot lately about sort of the growth of apologetics as uh, uh, as a, a growth of instructors, apologetic instructors, let's say. Uh, not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you have William Lane Craig, he's got chapters uh, all over the place of individuals that are teaching apologetics, and that's a good thing. Uh, Frank Turek uh, now has his uh, cross uh, cross examined institute to train instructors. One of the things I don't find that there, that is happening though is training missionaries that are apologetically equipped. So you know one of the things that that we do, now you're doing this already. That's what Russia Christie is. You have a whole group of missionaries in institutions that are apologetically trained doing mission work to unbelievers and believers who are confused. Mm -hmm. Midwest Christian Outreach, we're, we're never going to be big, and we're not ever going to be big for a particular reason. We don't train instructors. What we do is take people out and teach them how to be missionaries to Wiccans and to Buddhists and to Hindus. It's very hands-on, and it's a slow process. How should churches think about that aspect of the faith do you want to just train a group do you want to train a group of instructors i'm not saying that's a bad thing or do you want to uh, create a group of ambassadors a group of missionaries who are apologetically trained to actually go out and proclaim the gospel yes and yes um Again, the barbarians are, are not at the gates only now. They're in the citadels. Right. And so it's why I can find partnership with people like Peter Bogosian, people like Bill Maher, people like um, uh, Elon Musk, like Joe Rogan, uh, like Dave Rubin. I can find more camaraderie and common ground with some of those people than I have with many evangelical, quote unquote, pastors today. 
um, as Bogosian once said on a Christian program, you know, if if he had some kind of a game plan to destroy Christianity, he'd make all the Christian pastors woke. And that's what's been happening, because right. when we excommunicated the life of the mind in evangelicalism a century ago, retaining the hands and the heart of Christ at the expense of the head of Christ, we created a vacuum. And as shepherds, we have been derelict of duty and we have allowed false ideologies to creep into the church. Um, and we don't know what to do with it except for embrace them and fulfill them. So, so you know, you, you find some crazy things like, of course, it's February when it was, you know, Pride Month recently. And you have the National Church, which is like one of the biggest and oldest churches in America having all the pride and lighting inside of the church, right? At the other end of the country in San Francisco, you had what used to be an Orthodox uh, Presbyterian church. You have not just drag queen story hour, you have drag queen Bible story hour happening. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of what happened uh, during the intertestamental period where Antiochus Epiphanes came into the um, into the, the Jewish temple and sacrificed on the altar a pig in honor of Zeus. That's what's happening right now. Right. When you go to Yale, and I was just there a couple of months ago uh, to meet with a professor there, you now have in Yale Divinity School a systematic theologian who is a lesbian and has a book called Queer Theology Beyond Apologetics. In other words, we don't need to make a defense for this anymore. We need to get to the business of flushing this through the system because it's already defensible yeah. and acceptable. I think we need to abnormalize that. Normalize, yeah. No, abnormalize. Uh, I think we I think yeah. we need to flip it. You know, they, they've normalized it. Now we have to abnormalize it. Yeah. Uh, Larry Generous uh, asked about uh, Calvin University. Calvin is gone. Okay. For all practical purposes. Yeah, I mean, there uh, the the Reformed denomination that oversees it. I have seen some pushback from them, and time will tell whether the university of the denomination heeds their instructions and washes the university. But as it is right now, yeah, it's it's gone. It's Calvin for a, quite a long time, uh, enjoyed wine and cheese parties in academia and um, considered it, you know, they wanted the respect of, of the world and adopted their ideologies. And so what was the home of Alvin Plantinga, <laughs> um, Antiochus Epiphanes has come into that that university. Wow. Wow. Well, Plantinga had issues too. <laughs> yeah. um, nothing was, like this. Nothing like this, no. But he was part of the decline, uh, epistemologically, you know, and so on. Something but, that you were commenting on with this professor uh, about uh, beyond apologetics. Uh, I was reminded to work on the blog for this week, and we have a quote from George Yancey, who does an interesting, interesting uh, book, uh, Who's More Political, Progressive or Conservative Christians, who does an article on that. Uh, and he points out that there's a, a Christian had drawn a cartoon of Jesus saying, quote, the difference between me and you is you use scripture to determine what love means. I use love to determine what scripture means. Yeah. So yeah. what we have is a whole generation in the church, outside the church, who want to use the Bible, sort of, but they approach it with what they already want it to say and then try to find scriptures that seem to support their position. How many have picked that up from the church? Yeah, so this notion of eisegesis, I mean, um, Vodi Bakum, uh, African-American scholar and pastor, 
uh, says that many Christians today are, are reading primarily through the lens of um, sociology and culture rather than through the lens of theology and scripture. And so we have this uh, cliche now, love is love. Your neighbor might have the sign in their lawn. Love is love. Uh, akin to another meme, water is water, whether from the tap or the toilet. <laughs> right? right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, love means something. Love means willing the good of the other, not wishing it, but willing the good of the other. And good is not subjective. There is an objective notion of good, like there is good health. You can't just say, well, my opinion is if I if I want to eat as much cotton candy as I want, then I, I can consider myself well, and self-identify well, as healthy. And well, I can write I mean, journals and fat studies. And, and I would say, that, that. yeah, I would say we're really losing that. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, on the one hand, you've got warnings about obesity. And in, on the other hand, you have warning against fat shaming. And we also now mutilation of body parts is considered health care. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's really any, I mean, the, the center will not hold, uh, to to quote uh, a 20th century poet, he, he asked the question, you know, I mean, I'm giving the answer. Yeah. The center is not going to hold. There is no center anymore. Always the question was, well, what comes after postmodernism, right? I mean, you had pre-modernism, then you had modernity, and post-modernism might be a reaction to modernity, or some people call it hypermodernism. You know, where, where to go from here? Um, and Peter Bogosian would say, you know, this stuff is not sustainable. Like you say, the, the center will not hold. Well, it's, it's holding right now, and it's going to hold for some time. I, I don't, it's, it, it's not sustainable forever, right? Um, I mean, Rome and Greece that were partially responsible for developing Western civilization. It was really, you know, uh, what have Jerusalem to do with Athens? It was a combination of Jerusalem, Rome, and, and Greece um, in developing Western civilization and some of the attitudes and principles that we, you know, have embraced. Um, Rome ended with the Colosseum. The empire dissolved. And yeah, uh, empires don't stand forever and America won't last forever. And the center won't hold or it's not sustainable, right? But it might be that last ditch effort which is necessary to bring in the Colosseum and the end of America. I, I don't think we should give up. I'm writing is, yeah. is, you know, from campus to culture an alternative vision for the future while we still have time. Yeah. I, I don't think we should give up the fight. I, I, uh, I think we need to create new options at the same time. You know, I, I don't, yeah. I'm not into the Benedict option either for, um, you know, the yeah. church or for higher education. Uh, I'm just saying we're, we're becoming increasingly polarized. Uh, the center is evaporating before our eyes. So if you look at the center, ah, it's just I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we are, you know, it's going to come, I think, it, you know, sure. Uh, miracles can happen. Tides can change. Uh, and, and we don't know what the future holds. Uh, but, you know, right now, the way things are going, it looks like the option is to keep keep on fighting, keep on fighting for the institutions that that matter, that's the, that will continue to matter in in our in our society. But I think we're going to need places like Hillsdale, like University of Austin. You know, we're going to need we're going to need competition. Uh, we're going to need, gonna need churches that are willing to stop and say, "I may lose people if we do this, but we're going to get back to basics." Yeah. I really like Don Williams' book, 95 Theses for uh, a New Reformation. I think it's one of the more important books I've read in years. Uh, and we took a group through that. Uh, because it, it basically lays out, here's what the five theses were. Here's the five theses about the five theses. Here's mm -hmm. the five theses on apologetics, the five theses on worship music. 
and he lays out really how a church ought to be operating, including mm. evangelism and apologetics. Mm. Uh, and our churches actually, we're going to be our churches are going to be doing this as a, as a church. They're going to go through the book in their adult ed starting on Sunday mornings in September, right. because it's such an important book. So that's one very good issue that needs to be accomplished. Uh, is that is that a perfect solution? No, but he, he does emphasize also the life of the mind. Now, you brought that up, Dr. James Sire, like James Sire, he and I were friends, and years ago, that was his big complaint. He said the, the, the Christian mind is just non-existent, but that's that's a sin, really, because the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You're supposed to have your mind engaged in life of faith, and it's just not. Uh, it is, as you pointed out, uh, lights and smoke. Uh, it is live entertainment on Sunday morning to get people in the door. Well, you know what? what? What are the areas Teach we found the word? What well, one of the areas we failed is we've encouraged the life of the mind, but we've kept it all on the high shelf. You know, we've we've kept a lot of it or most of it on the high shelf. In other words, the light. I don't think, like you, you take a phrase like the hypostatic union. You know, the average person in your church pews can understand what that means if you explain it to them. You know, but when you keep on referring to the hypostatic union, you know, <laughs> it's, it, you've, you've, you've kept it on the high shelf. There's, yeah. a, there's a, a, a movie called um, A Margin Call, and something has gone terribly wrong with this particular investment corporation. So they bring in the CEO because everything's about to collapse like a house of cards. And it all involves a, a very... Um, a very complex set of mathematical calculations that these guys from MIT who are working for this brokerage firm right. can understand. So they bring in the CEO and they're, they they want to start explaining it to him and they hesitate and he goes, explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. <laughs> this is the, the CEO, you know, <laughs> he's a very bright guy. Obviously he's the CEO, but you know, it, that's, I'm not saying we have to explain theology like our people are five-year-olds, but we have to explain it to them so they can understand it. And it's, it's not hard, yeah. uh, but you know what it does when you don't do that, when you, when you don't develop that as a, as part of your academic habit, as part of your, you know, as part of how you train people to, to think deeply when, how to explain it clearly, what you do is you provide cover for the liberals who come in and keep yeah. on, you, now you've provided them with camouflage. Yeah, you know, it's it's a tough, there are no easy solutions, but when you're talking about getting back to the basics, right? Um, in the New Testament, there was this new development called deacons because there was a felt need. So you had people that did that so the pastors could focus intently on the word and prayer. And in the 20th century, you had this new focus called campus ministries because the church wasn't going to the universities. In fact, we were losing our children to the universities. And you had this new movement called youth pastors uh, because there was a lot of people now that kids didn't have Christian parents from the 60s. And so there was a youth pastor that could take those kids. And then the Christian parents said, hey, could you take my kid on Wednesday night too? And then eventually it led to both parents working out in the field, you know, and saying, can you just educate my kid? I'm exhausted. And then eventually that led to the youth pastor trying to educate and he wasn't being educated. And right. so he brought in skinny jeans and fog machines. And, and that's what it <laughs> amounted to. And so going back to the basics now, um, all parents wrestle with this. I get this. This is not easy. You got to start somewhere. And so, you know, I have like with my youngest daughter, we're going through middle school level Lee Strobel series, The Faith for Christ, the, faith, the Case for Christ, The Case for Faith. So we're reading through those books. We're going to Panera Bread on Sundays, just her and I, daddy, daughter, get a meal, and we, we read the book. Um, with my oldest daughter, we're doing a study through the book of Esther, trying to help her understand not just the content of the Bible, but how to read the Bible. Right. Because our, our churches aren't teaching that anymore. Right. Um, not a lot of them are. 30 years ago, we had to make the choice between Sunday school and small groups because people were only giving three hours a week. And most churches got rid of Sunday school. They got rid of Christian education 
in the fa- in favor of relationships. Relationships are important, and mm-hmm. you only get so much time. And then because the non-believing world was there, the Sunday morning services now were dumbed down to bring Buzz Lightyear in and Dorothy and you know theology of the movies. And you watched a movie for 25 minutes. That's happening at like Saddleback Church, largest church in America. And then they'll add three or four verses. I have a church in my area that does that too. So, you know, we need to get back and say, okay, parents, you got to, you got to count the cost. I get it. The economics, because of our politicians has created a disaster and it's really hard to make it out there if both people aren't working, but you got to count the cost. And even if you are forced to both work still, what are you doing when you get home? You're tired, you're exhausted. There are video games, there is Netflix, and there's your children. Don't leave it to the skinny jeans fog machines youth pastor right, getting right. nothing from his training from the pastor or from the seminaries. Right. Now, Rashio Christie, we have some resources uh, starting this month, uh, later this month, I think. Uh, we will have over 35 booklets that are almost all written by PhDs at the 9,000 9, word level, so they're concise, and written at the 11th grade reading level on everything from the how to read the Bible, the reliability of the Bible, the problem of evil, the relationship of scripture and science by people like Stephen Myers of the Discovery Institute, or the evidence for the resurrection, which is one of two PhDs by Dr. William Lane Craig. We forced those guys to write at the 11th grade reading level. Everything from classical apologetics and how to read the Bible to cultural apologetics, including race, class, sex, gender, and things like that. So these are our tools um, that people can have that are free for download, or you can, by the end of the month, be able to purchase them from our website, RC Press. So just Google Rashio Christie Press, and you, you'll land there, and you'll be able to see all these. You can use these in your youth groups. You can use them for Sunday school, for Christian ed. Parents can use them for you know, three-time discussion groups with their kids or whatever. Parents have got to start educating their kids. It's, it's right. not left to the teachers or to the youth pastors. And educate themselves in the process. Yeah. Right. So, all right. That is a good word. Get that material. Uh, there's good, there is good material to use. And for those pastors, and there are many good pastors. I, I, I know I ride that horse sometimes. Yep, there are. Who want to do the right thing, but don't even know where to start anymore because they're sort of in competition with the seeker-friendly whatever kind of a church. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so contact Rachel Christie. Contact us. We will help you find resources and uh, move in a, in a more biblical sound direction to educate and equip your families churches to not only live in but confront a pagan culture we are very much like the first century roman empire that the church was born in so if you want to know how to live in a pagan culture read the new testament how about that ron you want to walk us out of here yeah, let's give credit to whom credit is due. Our resident cult leader profiler is Neil before me. Our wardrobe manager is C. Ellen Fitzhugh. Culinary services are provided by Chef Ham and Cheese. Our tinfoil hat provisioner is just in case. Jehovah's Witnesses coverage comes from Armageddon and D. Opposer. Our Mormon archives manager is Polly Gummis. Our liberal denominations bureau chief is Lucy Goosey. Our transgender issues coverage comes from Ben Hur. Special correspondent for cults based on the Hindenburg disaster and flying turkeys. Oh, the humanity. Our fact-checking supervisor is Joe Pulling. Technical assistance comes through Murky Research. Our legal advisors are at the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Our grievance resolution director is Giovanna Pisami. Director of privacy assurance is why you're tapping. And original idea sourcing comes from Drew A. Blank. The Unknown Webcast is a production of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in cooperation with Emergency Manicure Productions, both of whom are solely responsible for this content, although you will never be able to prove that in a court of law. Never, never, never happened. Many have tried. No, actually, nobody's tried. But anyways. All right. So, with thank that, you, Corey Miller. And broadcast. We should Corey, have end applause, you. too. You know? yeah. <laughs> thank you, guys. Appreciate what you're doing. Keep